this is Jolie Holland. Welcome to the Ghost Story Salon. We have Lindsay Verrill on of Lil Maison from Austin, Texas. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I'm glad to be here. How has your creative process been during the pandemic? What's it been like for you? It's been interesting because I've always just had this identity as a musician. And I felt at the beginning of this pandemic that my identity was like in question. I was like, oh God, what do I do I do if I if I can't? Like all these things, all these dreams, you know, all this like reflexive like life that I have, that I've created, my community felt felt very far away. My identity felt very far away. It's kind of a, a bigger answer, I guess. I had to grieve that. And then um, I've just spent a lot of time like getting down with myself and like being like, I'm not what I do. <laughs> I've been a lot within myself doing things internally and I'm grateful for the time to do that. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to get a sense of who you are outside of just what we do. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a ghost story? I definitely have a ghost story. It's so um, scary. Oh, really? Not too many people tell me actually scary ghost stories. Wow. I'm sitting here in the dark with a candle. I live with my partner and he's out right now. So this is properly, properly scary. These ghosts are contained. I don't think they're close to you or me. So. Right. But I think the thing about a scary ghost story is it makes you like question like the fabric of reality. Yes, it's true. And this This experience definitely put the fabric of reality into question. Do you want to know it? Yes, please. Well, here it is, so... When I was 22 years old, I went up to Washington State to work for the Forest Service um, on a trail crew on the Olympic Peninsula. And I had never been to the Pacific Northwest, so going up there kind of felt like the whole universe turned upside down. Like I was like, what are all these trees and these mountains and this cold and Everything's cold. The water's cold. People swim in the cold river. I don't understand. I don't understand those people, but I still don't understand that. But um, I moved to this really small town and I was living in these kind of like barracks um, with all these other people that were working for Olympic National Forest. And there was kind of a crossroads in town. There was a little kind of general store. There was a fire station, the ranger station. That was pretty much it. And then the Hood Canal to one side. And I started to meet, there was like this, I didn't spend a lot of time in the town because I was always like out working, but there was this weird darkness there. And I started to meet all of these people that were connected with this story that just sort of had the town under this kind of darkness on top of it being kind of dark place like literally like clouds and rain and these dark trees that I had never seen before and one of the first people that I met was this firefighter who lived like in the barracks in one of the other buildings but he had like a um a disability he had like a one one leg that didn't function and part of his arm didn't function, but he was kind of like my neighbor and my my friend, and I got to know him. And through him, I started to understand this story 
there was a few years prior, there was a car accident um, on the highway 101 nearby. And there was a teenage boy driving a pickup truck and his sister was in the passenger side and they had a collision with a family. He, he fell asleep driving. Anyway, he fell asleep driving and drove the truck into oncoming traffic and he killed his family. Um, and there was one survivor in the car. There were like several children and the sister died and he died. And I just started to meet everyone in this town that was like, started to meet parents of the children that worked at the store. And the anyway, the, my friend, the firefighter was the driver of the other car. And then his father was the paramedic that um, was the first person on the scene. And it was just like, this whole town was like involved in this accident and everyone had this kind of dark sorrow about it. And it would come up. Like I would talk, I would meet someone and I would be like, Oh, I live near so-and-so. And they would be like, Oh, he was involved in this. Or uh, one of the pastimes of people that I, I would meet. So we, we go crabbing, <laughs> which was also new. I was like, what is this? go out in a boat and you drop the cage in the water and then you sit out there for hours and then you pull the cage up and it's full of crabs. But I would hear people would tell me about this accident that happened and I never really got a clear picture of where it was, but there's this funny place in the road where you would get a chill when you were driving it was kind of a place where the road dipped I, I would always be in the truck with someone and I would be like oh it's the spot where you get a chill we were always like oh it's because of the, the dip or the trees or the but there really was no explanation and I learned later that that was the the site of this accident everyone knew about this this feeling in this place feel like it was presence of ghosts. Did you start feeling it when, when you were alone or were you driving with other people when you felt it? It was so present that we would just be like, there it is. Like, it didn't matter who was in the car. But there were other people in the car or was it? Yes. I was rarely alone there. I think that's so interesting. And I'm not trying to like debunk your story, but a couple summers ago, me and my boyfriend, Stevie Weinstein Boner, we got to go to Lithuania where his family lived for some hundreds of years. So his, yeah, his family's Jewish and they used to live in these little villages around this town called Vilna in Yiddish. And then, um, Today, it's called Vilnius. And, you know, back in the day, it was like, it was considered the Jerusalem of Europe. Like, it was a very Jewish area. And the history there is so amazing. Like, it was the last holdout of paganism in Europe. It was a defensive tower. And you could see there was a copy of this letter that the king sent to the pope at the time. And it said basically, like, can you call off the Knights Templar because they're a pain in the fucking ass? Like, quit, quit fucking with us. And eventually he just decided to say that he was Christian because he was tired of fighting all these wars with the Pope. And there was like all these battle axes that were at this museum and you just got this really intense feeling of, of how brutal warfare was back then. Like there was a cannonball that was like the size of 
a bowling ball, maybe a little bigger, and it had the Knights Templar bullshit carved on it. It was a really heavy vibe. And of course, that's that area is where some of the first mass murders in the Holocaust began. And we went to the this like massive grave, you know, grave site where like a hundred thousand people were murdered. And we ate a bagel there. (laughs) (laughs) There was so much to learn from that site. It was very, very peaceful. You know, like you really had this sense of like, now it's just a forest. Like all these horrible things happen there, but now it's just a forest. And we had some time in the city of Vilna. It was so cool. It was so beautiful. It was one of those... European cities that like there was no good reason to bomb it during World War II or or maybe parts of it were bombed like but the medieval center of town was pretty complete and there is the old wall around the city in the days when you had to you know close up shop and deal with them um, being sieged or whatever and there was this chapel within the wall of Vilna And it was like, there was this like amazing archway that you could close off with these huge iron gates. And above that, within the wall, there was this little chapel and it was so gorgeous. Like there was this huge icon of Mary and I'm not Catholic or Orthodox. I don't, I think it was a Catholic thing. It might've been Orthodox. I don't even know. And we got to visit this tiny chapel and it hit both of us so hard. Like it was like, like you're talking about going by that site, like full body chills. It was so powerful. And we thought about it later. Like, I think it was just a contact high from everybody who was there in the room, you know, everybody that was like praying And that's one way that, you know, we can think about those kind of experiences is that it's a social thing. We can like catch these things from each other. It was really beautiful. And like this, you know, this very like moving experience. Wow. Yeah, that paints an an amazing picture. Do you know where your people are from in Europe? Um, Yes, they are from Scotland. Most of my people too. Do you have any family ghost stories at all? You know, I had a really crazy experience over the pandemic. My grandmother and I were close when I was a child, and she died when I was 19. And I wasn't able to be with with her when she died, and I'm still kind of processing that, I suppose. But she came to me in a dream a few months ago and I was able to speak with her and I I told her that I was sorry that I couldn't be there she said she said this kind of esoteric thing um she said I'll be with you in sunlight and shadow and I I woke up with this sense that I had been with her I mean, I'm feeling it right now. It's like since that I had been with her in the dream, I still feel it. It's like a really um, powerful and timely visit. Wow. So your grandfather was born during the last pandemic that we had here. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. You know, like I, I was, I, um, I've been nannying for some kids. That's like kind of how I've been keeping things going financially. And I was 
talking to someone about how this is going to affect them. And I was reminded that I grew up during the AIDS epidemic and how that really affected me like as a person and what, you know, my perspective on so many things and the way I lived. And I didn't really put it together that the AIDS epidemic was so influential on my, I mean, on everyone, of course. Do you remember people not knowing how you got it? Yes. I remember thinking you could get it from other kids. Like we thought that we were going to give it to each other. Like, you know, so little, I was in like first or second grade and they didn't really explain what it was or how it was passed from person to person. Cause I guess they didn't want to talk about that with us. I was born in 1975. What year were you born? Um, 1982. Okay. So I guess that when I heard about it, I had more of like a sense of how it was transmitted, but that makes sense that like this mythology would get passed down to kids like with, that they wouldn't want to um, talk about sex or. Yeah. Or about gay people too. Did that reflect back for you during this time period when, when people were like, I don't know how you get it. You can get it from your groceries or. No, I feel like AIDS was scarier than, I mean, this was scary for sure, but it was like, you get AIDS and you're just dead. It just kills you dead. You know, when I was a teenager and they were, they were definitely teaching abstinence, they had this added like ammo. They're like, not only will God hate you, but you'll get AIDS and you'll be dead. Oh my God. I just was like, so terrified of having sex when I was a teenager. Cause I was like, what if I get AIDS on top of the whole hell thing? Right. Cause that must've imprinted like your whole experience of hitting puberty too. Definitely. I think it really did. I've never really considered that until this pandemic and just thinking about, yeah, kids having experiences now. Because our our first reaction as adults is like, oh, God, there's nothing like this. Like these kids are and and in a certain way, it's true. You know, like kids ask questions. A lot of us grownups, we don't have answers for what what's happening or what to do. But I realized that the AIDS epidemic was was like this. It was a similar time and there was a lot of fear and a lot of real danger but kind of mixed together and confusing and then also mixed with like moralism. And, and I I think now it's mixed kind of with weird moralism too, where we're just like, you got to do what's right for the common good. And I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly on board with that, but I'm just curious how it's going to play out. Yeah. I'm curious how it's going to mark the kids. I had been thinking about how it would mark us, but because we're adults, like we already had a fully formed personality before this hit. So it, yeah, it might affect the kids more than us. I mean, they, they miss over a year of school. That's unfathomable. You know, kids thrive so much on routine and knowing what's coming up and just being taken all of a sudden out of school, not just seeing their friends not really understanding why it's just kind of interesting I see like little kids walking around with their parents with their masks on wrong or like how do you get a kid to wear a mask but yeah there was this attitude like that kids couldn't get it for a while too which is so reckless for me the thing I was um really sad to see during the pandemic is just how far the misinformation would be carried and how far, like, to me, it looks like shades of eugenics. Wow. Like the, because there was, I mean, especially among like new age, you hippie, alterna health people, 
there was this attitude like, well, nobody's dying except old people and sick people and people who are weak, you know, and it's that's it's so Nazi ish. It's it's so it's so eugenics. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, I know that like the Swedish government didn't do enough in a lot of people's eyes to to contain the virus. And okay, I might be speaking out of turn. Like I understand the Swedish government, but it was like an attitude like, well, it'll just kill all the people who are who are like gonna die anyway, so whatever. And a lot of a lot of uh, pushback in Europe about that attitude. My my housemate is from Norway. He was at the beginning of the pandemic, he was kind of spirited away. <laughs> The Norwegian government was like, all Norwegians in the U.S. should come home because it's a third world country. (laughs) Yeah, we earned that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So he's, how is he doing? He's good. He lives in Norway now, um, which is sad and I miss him. But um, yeah, just totally super disruptive. lives he was like he's a wonderful musician jazz bass player i'm sure he's finding plenty to do there but it's it's weird that's cool that he could be that he could like play jazz bass in the states closer to where it came from the new Tina Turner movie last night. Oh, I've been wanting to see that. I thought there was some really cool stuff in there that I hadn't hadn't seen before. When she started the second part of her career, it was in Europe and England. And I, I just like thinking about what those places do to these all these musical forms that we start over here. Like they really they really take things and run with them in a, sometimes in an amazing way. Yeah, totally. It's interesting being an American musician in Europe. They're unexpected, an unexpected, like, feeling of, like, a treasure. Like, I have a treasure, and I didn't even know. Yeah, I, I remember going up to uh, Canada and playing violin with some Canadian up there. And like I'm, I do have Cajun family. I have Creole family, and I remember like playing the violin. And somebody said, "Oh, you have a really nice Cajun style." And I was like, "What, really?" You know, I didn't even know. Or like people said, "Oh, you sound really American." <laughs> and that, that I didn't know what to do with that. It was so funny because they have Cajun style fiddle up there in well in Quebec, I guess. Oh yeah, right. Like a different, um, like different expressions of it. But like when it gets down to South Louisiana, it's so, it's so Africanized. It's really different rhythms. Thank you for telling your story. Um, thanks for being on the Ghost Story Salon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a really interesting conversation. Mm-hmm.